As a children's pastor, with the singing, not only singing, but I want you to, I just wanted to encourage you to use your body, especially for the second song, right? All right, we're going to sing Sala Rai. Here we go. Savior is teaching me to be 
hopes and all my hopes all I need held in your hands all my life all of me held in your hands and all my fears all my dreams held in your hands mm. and in your Again, God, whatever comes my way, God, whatever comes my way, I will trust you. Give me understanding that I may keep your law and observe it with my whole heart. Lead me in the path of your commandments, for I delight in it. Incline my heart to your testimonies and not to selfish gain. Turn my eyes from looking at worthless things and give me life in your ways. God, I pray that uh, through your word and through all that's been going on in this nation, I pray, Father, that you would teach us what is more important, God, that Seeking after this world will give us nothing. But God, we pray that especially with all the tragedy that's happened uh, with the Sewer Ferry and even with the accidents on the subway on Line 2, uh, we thank you that it's a reminder that uh, life is unpredictable. But we thank you that you're a God who is always presenting us with salvation. We thank you that you are a God who understands what it means to lose your son, what it means to lose a loved one. And I pray for all these families that they will turn to you, that they will realize that there is no one, nothing, God, that can comfort them like you do. So God, I pray, um, Father, that you will open your arms wide. Father, that even to our service today, that you welcome and you embrace all the children that are here today. We know, Lord, to them belongs the kingdom. And so, Father, we pray, even for ourselves, no matter how old we may be, Father, that our identity is always as a child of God. And so, Father, as we look forward to tomorrow, as we celebrate Children's Day, Father, we pray that it's a reminder that we are all children of God. And we thank you that we can call you our Father. And we thank you that you desire to give us not only good things, but you want to give us the best things. And so, Lord, may we... Learn to impart that wisdom, that grace, that knowledge to our children and to the next generation. That they will grow up knowing and understanding and fearing God in a way that will really bring a revolution to this generation. And so God, we thank you that we can participate and honor and worship you today. And in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. 
All right, it was great to see um, all the children up here uh, praising, and it was great to see some of you get excited, and you know, I don't know if Pastor Stephanie saw who were the ones that were jumping up and down, but I would recruit them. You know, I'd be like, hey, you want to join our children's ministry? You know, uh, it's great to see that kind of passion, um, that kind of heart, and I'm thankful that we're having this uh, children's or family service, and you know, more and more I see kids I, I see how much that I really enjoy uh, the, the children that we have in our ministry and even for myself. Um, I don't know if many of you know, but um, before I got married, uh, I remember as my wife and I, as we were dating, uh, we discussed with each other like how many kids we wanted to have. And so I, I asked my wife you know, as we were dating, like, how many kids do you want to have? And she's like, oh, I only want to have one. And so I was like, are you sure? She's like, yeah, you know, my parents have always told me, they've influenced me, they told me, only have one kid. And I was kind of shocked, you know, because she's so good with kids. I was like, oh, she's, she's got to have more than one. And so I was like, okay, I got to think of a plan. I got to think of a way that we can have more kids. And so <laughs> I remember as we were doing our, our premarital class, um, the pastor was asking us that question. They were asking, he was asking us, how many kids do you want to have? And so uh, I remember she answered, and she gave her answer as one. And then uh, when I answered, I, gave, I told him three. And so he was like, what? He said, are you sure you know what you're talking about? I said, yeah, I'm sure. He's like, if you have three, that changes everything. I was like, okay, well, what do you mean? He's like, well, number one, you're outnumbered. Okay, two parents, three kids. You're going to go crazy, all right? Uh, another thing, number two, uh, he was saying that you're, you have to purchase a different kind of car. You can no longer have a sedan, no sports car for sure, but you're going to have to drive around a minivan. Right? So he's trying to scare me. He's like, oh, I like minivans. All right? <laughs> but then he's like, well, then also you're going to face number three, which is the middle child syndrome. It's like, so number two is always going to feel like you know, left out or feel like um, you know, there's something going on. So you got to be careful of the middle child syndrome. So are you sure you want to have three kids? And I told my pastor, I was like, I know what I'm doing. I have it all planned out. You see, in my mind, I was thinking, because I wanted two, I figured, you know, since, you know, if I say three, she says one, we'll subtract, we'll compromise, all right? So we'll have two. And that was my entire thinking. I was like, Oh, I wanted to have like that nuclear family, you know, the dad, the mother, and then the son, and then the daughter, right? So that was my picture-perfect uh, idea of what a family should look like. And so I was confident, you know, I, I, re- I felt like this is what God would give us, all right? And so it's so funny because when I plan, God laughs, all right? And so he looked at this, he's like, you silly little oh, fool, <laughs> I got something else in mind for you. And so uh, I don't know if my wife was playing reverse psychology on me, but, you know, after our second child, she really wanted a third. I was like, oh, really? Okay. So we went on, we had our, our third child. But then we weren't planning on our fourth child. And so I remember a few summers ago, uh, my wife and uh, the, the children went off to Chicago for a summer vacation, and I was still here in Korea. And I received a call. She was calling me on the internet phone, calling me from Chicago. So I was like, oh, this must be really important. So I picked up the phone. I was like, you know, what's going on? What's going on? She's like, I'm pregnant. <laughs> and then she started crying on the phone. So I was like, I wasn't sure. Was she happy? Was she sad? <laughs> uh, I won't tell you the answer. But um, so it was a big surprise. Uh, we realized that God had blessed us with uh, a fourth child. And so... It's, uh, I tell people, you know, I wanted three, she wanted one. I thought we'd subtract, but somehow God added and said, here you go. <laughs> Your plan didn't work. <laughs> you get four kids. And so um, uh, that's how God works. So uh, we'll see. But anyway, I want to show you a picture uh, of our family. And this is a picture from taken actually last year uh, from our OEM retreat. And so it was a great time. Well, we really enjoyed it. And we're also looking forward to more families uh, signing up for this retreat. So just to show you the kind of time that we had. Uh, but we also went to the next picture. Uh, we went out to, down to Busan. And so there we found the beach. 
uh, here in Korea. I was like, oh, wow, it's actually pretty clean. And it's actually fun to, to be at. So kids really enjoyed it. And so uh, hopefully as you guys get to see a picture of my family, um, that I'll get to see you at the retreat and get to know your families as well. And so uh, hopefully this will be a good opportunity for all the families to get connected. And, you know, for myself, you know, as a parent, my concern has always been how am I going to raise my children? You know, my responsibility as a father means that I need to lead and guide my wife and my children in the ways of the Lord. And so for me, that's always been a a huge burden and a huge responsibility because I want to make sure that I do uh, my part right in, in discipling and training them. And so today we're going to be looking at uh, Joshua chapter 4. And so if you have your Bibles or your smartphones, if you can turn to that. And we're going to see in this passage some instructions. And here we'll gain some insights on how we are called to lead our families. So turn to Joshua chapter 4. And we're going to be looking at uh, this chapter. And the title of today's message is Family Memorial Stones. family memorial stones. And the first thing that we'll see in this passage is the call to remember your spiritual history. Okay? Remember your spiritual history. And I'll start off. As the chapter starts off, it says, When all the nation had finished passing over the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Take twelve men from the people, from each tribe a man, and command them, saying, Take twelve stones from here, out of the midst of the Jordan, from the very place where the priest's feet stood firmly, and bring them over with you, and lay them down in the place where you lodge tonight. You see, what had happened was an epic event. All right? if, you look, if you're familiar with the book of Joshua, in chapter 3, they had just crossed the Jordan River. And so for the Israelites, this was something that they witnessed, they saw, and they were able to understand the the kind of God that they're serving that allow them to cross this river. And so as the the priests were carrying the Ark of the Covenant, uh, once their foot touched upon the waters, it's the scripture tells us that they walked on dry ground. Uh, It didn't say it was muddy ground, but it said it was dry ground. Because I'm sure if you guys have ever tried walking upon uh, muddy ground, you know how difficult it can be. You know, your foot gets stuck or, you know, someone, I remember when I was uh, jogging in a a muddy muddy ground, I remember spraining my ankle. It's just, it's very difficult to walk across that kind of circumstance. But it says here it was dry ground. Now, do you remember the last time something like this had happened in this proportion? Well, the last time was when Moses crossed the Red Sea. When they were running away to escape from Pharaoh and the Egyptian army that was coming after them. And so they were up against this Red Sea. They had nowhere else to go. And God opened it and allowed them to cross upon the Red Sea. Now, this is a picture of, of Moses when he was younger preparing to part the Red Sea. Can you see it? Imagine him, I I did that for the kids. Uh, Imagining him preparing, getting ready to part the Red Sea. And so he starts by practicing by parting his hair, right, Uh, in this mirror. And so we see here, 40 years later, Joshua is allowed to do the same thing. It's an act of God that they were able to walk through this. And if you've ever walked upon an empty swimming pool, uh, I don't know if you've ever witnessed that, but it's it's an amazing feet to, to actually see and to understand because when you're swimming you don't realize how deep it is but once all the water is gone and you're walking through you're like wow I didn't realize how deep this pool really is or uh, for instance I love it when children in Korea cross the road um, my little ones uh, my third one now is is learning to cross the street And in Korea, you know, because, you know, there's so many cars, there's so much traffic, and they teach them, you know, in the schools, when you cross the street, you raise your hand, right? And so I love it. Like my daughter, she's right, you know, the light turns green, she just raises her hand and just starts walking, right? And then all the cars just stop, 
right? And it's just an amazing teaching. I'm like, you know, you got to look both ways. You got to be careful. But for her, it's like, she's so confident. She's like, <laughs> and she just walks from point A to point B. And I can imagine these Israelites feeling the same way, seeing the waters just stopping and allowing, giving them the path to walk upon. And this is how they must have felt as they crossed the Jordan and the Lord gives them instructions. And we see these instructions in verse 2 to 5. It says, Take twelve men from the people, from each tribe a man, and command them, saying, Take twelve stones from here out of the midst of the Jordan, from the very place where the priest's feet stood firmly, and bring them over with you, and lay them down in the place where you lodge tonight. Then Joshua called the twelve men from the people of Israel, whom he had appointed, a man from each tribe. And Joshua said to them, Pass on before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of the Jordan, and take up each of you a stone upon his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the people of Israel. And we see that they obey what was asked of them, that each stone which represents a tribe of their nation. And then it goes on to say in verse 6 to 7, that this may be a sign among you, when your children ask in time to come, what do, these stone, what do those stones mean to you? Then you should tell them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it passed over the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. So these stones shall be to the people of Israel a memorial forever. Now, if you've ever been around children, uh, if you have children, or if you work with children, you know that children are naturally very curious. They're always asking questions. You know, for my kids, my older kids, they're always asking me, Daddy, what does this mean? Daddy, what does, like today, my son asked me, what does ripped off mean? <laughs> and I had to explain to him, you know, like, it's not a good idea to be ripped off, right? And so they're always asking questions. Children are very inquisitive. They need to know what's going on. Even if it's like an adult setting, like my wife and I, we're whispering, we're talking about a, a serious issue. And then my kids were like, what do you mean? Is something happening? And like, you know, don't worry, it doesn't have to do with you. Kids love to ask questions. And in the same way, uh, in this passage, these stones should invoke the same kind of questions that children like to ask. You see, they serve as a memorial. When they see these stones, they'll notice that these are not just ordinary stones that are just uh, happen to be in this certain place, but they're gathered together for a reason. And the purpose behind it is so that other people can ask, what does this mean? And so this authenticates, this proves that this event actually happened. Because of what took place, of why these stones are there. And so this will remind them of its significance for generations to come. These stones are not self-explanatory. A person cannot just see these stones and be like, oh, these stones represent, oh, when the, the Jordan River stopped and the Israelites crossed, right? It would require someone to sit down and explain to them and share with them what had happened. What do those stones mean? And I love that. And I, I hope that all of us, that we have things in our lives, in our homes, that would represent our spiritual history. For instance, like in my office, I have the picture frame of my two youngest children when they got dedicated here at OEM. And I, will, and I pray and I would love for one day when my kids would come up and ask me, what is that picture about? Who's in that picture? Why did you take that picture? Why is it hanging in your office? And there I can sit down and share with them and tell them, this is when we dedicated you to the Lord. And the promises that I made to God in raising you. And the responsibility that I have. And whenever I go on a mission trip, I always make it a point that I always buy something for my family that would remind them of this mission trip. Uh, I would buy certain things, whether it be an artwork or whether it be a t-shirt with the country name on it. And so that, that way, when they see it, when they wear it, whenever they're around it, they can ask that question, Daddy, why did you buy this? What does this, why do we have this country on this t-shirt? 
And then we can start a conversation and I can share with them the spiritual history behind what, it, what they're singing. You know, in the future, I would love for my wife and I to, to take a trip to Guam, to take our kids, to show them that this is where their parents had met. This is where all the struggles and how we were able to overcome these obstacles and get married and, and having them as our children. I would love to share that kind of history with my kids. And we see again in, the, in this chapter, in verse 21 and 22, that the memorials serve a purpose in getting the attention of the children to ask, what do those stones mean? Because we know as humans, we easily forget. You know, we forget important dates. You know, we forget uh, important information. And we all have things that need to remind us, whether it be an app on our phone or whether it be a sticky note that we place you know, on our desk or on the refrigerator. There are all these things that remind us of, of what God has done. Another example of a memorial uh, where we explain the history of it is when we have baptisms or when we have the Lord's Supper. These also serve as a memorial. That even though they're too young to maybe participate in the Lord's Supper, this will be a great way, an opportunity for you to share what it all means. Why we participate in the Lord's Supper. We can go back to the history behind why we do this. Teach your children the significance and history behind all that you do. The second thing that we also see in this passage is that we are called to remember the blessings. All right? Remember the blessings. And I'll read for us verse 8 and 9. It says, And the people of Israel did just as Joshua commanded, and took up twelve stones out of the midst of the Jordan, according to the number of the tribes of the people of Israel, just as the Lord told Joshua. And they carried them over with them to the place where they lodged, and laid them down there. And Joshua set up twelve stones in the midst of the Jordan, in the place where the feet of the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant had stood. And they are there to this day. And so we see here the representatives of these twelve tribes did exactly as Joshua had commanded them. They picked up the stones from the river. And the fact that they did this was a sign of obedience and that God would bless them because they were following the instructions of the Lord. If they had not obeyed God, they probably wouldn't have been able to witness all that they had. It's through their obedience that they experience the power of God. And so we always see obedience brings blessings. And the Israelites were not only obeying Joshua by listening to his commands, but they were in fact obeying God. Because at the end of verse 8, it says, Just as the Lord told Joshua. It's important that we teach our family to, to make disciplined attempts to preserve the memory of the great ways that God has blessed us. You know, there was one family that I got a chance to get to know, and as they were talking, they were sharing with me uh, one of the things that they had uh, in plan. And they shared that um, they wanted to sponsor a child. And I was like, oh, that's great. That's a, an awesome idea. But they said specifically they wanted to sponsor a child who was the same age as their son. And so by doing that, as their son gets older, they can imagine and picture their sponsor child growing along the same way, uh, in the same path, parallel with each other. And so they wanted to bless this sponsor child because of the blessing that they've received from God, seeing their son, seeing him grow, seeing how he's being changed, physically, emotionally, in so many different ways. So they felt like they wanted to, to be a blessing by sponsoring a child through compassion. And I was like, that is a great way to bless other people. We need to be reminded that, that God's blessing in our lives is not just to end right there. But when we are blessed, we are called to bless other people. And I pray that more people will do that as their children are growing up that they will take advantage of that, that they will remind their children of these memorials, perhaps having certain traditions in your families, in your homes, to remind them of the blessings that we have. Our blessings should flow to others. If God has blessed us, 
it is not just so that we will feel good. It's not just for us to feel comfortable and happy, but we are called to bless other people. So let's learn to bless others by serving those in need, uh, whether it's physical, whether it be emotional support, or financial, or even giving practical advice. These are all ways that we can be a blessing as a source from what God has given to us. The third thing that we see in this passage is remember the miracles. Right? Remember the miracles. And this comes from uh, Joshua 4, 23 to 24. It says, For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan for you until you passed over, as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea which he dried up for us until we pass over, so that all the peoples of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty, that you may fear the Lord your God forever. And so this is always something that will be on the minds of the Israelites, that they'll always remember this miracle that took place before their very eyes, that they not only saw the party of the Red Sea, but they will also have witnessed and encountered the parting of this Jordan River. And as they experience and they, as they have seen this miracle, how can that not shape and form your life? In the same way for us, many of us may have experienced miracles in our lives, maybe, maybe in ways that we may not have encountered or imagined, but we are called to remember those miracles. And when they reached and they set up camp at Gilgal, Joshua sets up a memorial with the stones that he took from the Jordan River. And I love one of the things that uh, my wife did when our, our firstborn, our first child was born, is that she took um, his feet and um, put them in clay and then placed them so that she will always, she can see the footprint of our first child as a reminder of the miracle that he was to us. You know, it's, it's interesting that every single one of our kids, all four kids, there was some kind of complication that took place during the pregnancy. And so that really made uh, my wife and I really, it challenged us in our faith. There were times where we thought that we may have lost one of our kids. Uh, she experienced a heavy bleeding uh, discharge during her pregnancy. And so we thought that there was a miscarriage. There was times where we thought that something would happen to our child if they were to be born. So there are all these things that uh, reminded us to, to be founded on, on prayer and understanding His Word. And every time we see them, it's a miracle that they're alive. And I want to remind them that they are a miracle. Just like these Israelites experienced this miracle of walking on the Jordan River, walking through it, that they can tell the future generation that God did this miracle in this area. That they can tell them that in their hour of need, that God showed up. That he, they can tell them that God is mightier than Mother Nature, than anything else in all creation, that God is the source of strength. Can we do that for our future generation? Maybe a lot of you might be single, but as you pray for your future family, for your future ch children, remember the blessings, remember your history, remember the miracles that God did in your life that you can pass on to them and that they can pass on to future generations because that is what brings glory and honor to our, our living God. Amen? Let us pray.